Okay, well, I think we'll start. Um, my name's John Gappa. I work for the Financial Times. Um, I write a column on business. Um, I've spent the last seven years in New York, and I've just returned to um, London after that. So I lived through the Lehman Brothers crisis in New York. Um, and the only observation I have today about living in New York or London is that I noticed, I looked at the weather in Brooklyn, where I used to live, and it's uh, nice and sunny today, so I'm missing it already. Um, we have a great panel here today. I think the only possible weakness of our panel is I suspect they're all slightly business, pro-business, and, um, and uh, pro-the-city, perhaps. We'll find out, and we'll find out whether or not there's any difference between the panel and the audience. Um, we're going to start off uh, with quick presentation of a few of the diverse things the panel have got to say in three minutes each, and I'm going to call on James to start off. Okay, um, I'll try to get this relatively short. Um, at Policy Exchange, um, we, we looked into, or are looking into, corporate governance uh, in some detail, and we started with the Vince um, Cable's review on uh, exec comp. And Part of what I think about businesses is that you can't necessarily ask businesses to be altruistic just for the sake of it. You know, at the end of the day, uh, they want to make profits, the owners want to make profits, and that's the basis of a capitalistic system. So what we ask ourselves is what's going wrong, or what has gone wrong, um, to the extent that we have these banking crises and um, we've had a shareholder spring and executive pay. And I would argue that what's broken down um, particularly on the corporate side is the, the kind of principal agent, uh, which is that the owners of the businesses don't really control the businesses anymore, um, and the executives don't have the right structure in terms of incentive and compensation. So what we looked at doing in our exec pay report and what we're taking forward uh, in other areas is so how do you align the interests of you know, the owners of the business, which are long-term success, and the executive? Now, in our executive pay paper, we said that part of the problem with uh, a lot of uh, things that have gone wrong, we looked at RBS, we looked at punched patterns, we looked at cable and wireless, amongst others. If you look at where companies have made errors and where they've failed and the executives have failed, frequently it's where the incentive structure has been too short term. So executives have made decisions uh, on a short term basis which have then been bad news for the company in, in the long run. So our proposal was that you should extend out the incentive payments. So, the bizarrely named long-term incentive plan uh, generally has uh, a duration of three years, which isn't particularly long-term for most companies. So we proposed extending it to five years, and then we would take any compensation from that, and any other variable compensation, and pay it out over a five-year period. So what it means is that a decision taken today is still affecting your compensation in ten years' time. So that's a way of changing uh, the uh, perspective of, of those executives. And I think that would change... Um, a lot of the way a lot of those guys behave. We also talked about having clawback because, again, if you think of an entrepreneur, when a business is successful, he makes money, but when a business fails, he loses money. And again, very much in the current system, it was true of the bankers uh, in sort of 06, 07, 08, uh, and it's true of a number of executives even today. If you fail, the worst that happens is you get fired. And what we're trying to put in place, or what we argue should put in place, is a proper clawback system where if you breach certain targets, uh, your pay can be clawed back. Now, in our proposal that all variable comp is only paid over a five-year period, if you do it in equal stages, you end up with, on, on average, somewhere around about yeah, two and a half to three years compensation being stacked up. So you do have something which uh, is, is vulnerable there. So that's about aligning incentives. Uh, we've also talked about changing other areas of corporate governance. I thought the John Kay review was uh, a very interesting piece of work. It talks a lot about the responsibility of shareholders um, starting to hold uh, executives to, to account. I think that's um, beginning to happen. I think you are seeing a change in fund management behaviour uh, and that, that was most clearly illustrated by the shareholder spring. Um, quite how we continue to tweak that model to make sure that shareholders, um, fund managers, whose responsibilities aren't necessarily toward corporate governments, maintain that pressure, I think remains to be seen. There are other ways you can do it, and one of the ways that we feel there's a real weakness in the UK system. This is something which was pretty good at the UK, which is we rely on the talented amateur instead of the professional and the non-executive director class. And I think there's too many MDs that have 
too many roles, too, too many um, appointments, such that you know, I've had a number of stories of NEDs turning up to meetings and literally opening a pack of paper in front of them, that's the first time they've looked at it. One of our proposals is that non-executive directors will be limited to a maximum of five directorships, uh, which they would have to devote at least four weeks to. Uh, and so you have non-executive directors who can question the executive. Again, if you think about a, a, an organisation like RBS, no one questioned Fred, Fred Goodwin. No one felt able to take him to task. We're also thinking of giving NEDs the power to actually commission um, reports, independent reports, into proposals of the executive. So I'll just float those as a, as a few ideas. Right. A lot of ours is about you know, restructuring our incentives to bring them better into the line. Okay, we can talk about some of those topics, uh, Adam. Um, I, I think I come at this from a very different perspective. I mean, I, I represent about 104,000 companies with 5 million employees. Um, they range from sole traders up through to PLCs uh, and in all sectors across the economy, rather than just in the sort of city-based uh, uh, sectors, financial sector. Um, there are companies that consider themselves very responsible, going back to the title of our discussion today already. And quite frankly, if you go outside the M25 and spend time with them, they're sick to the back teeth of the way both the political class and the media discuss this notion of responsible business. Um, they feel like the political class has effectively appointed itself as judge and jury uh, of the business community, when in fact these are the people who are volunteering in schools, these are the people who uh, are doing their very best to train up young people where the state and the family have failed. These are the people whose basic entrepreneurial instincts are generating tax revenues. So there, there is quite a strong depth of feeling, and I think it shouldn't be underestimated out there in the real economy amongst many companies, whether privately held or PLCs, about the level of state intervention that's sometimes proposed in this, in this area. Um, just make four very quick points, if I can, and hopefully uh, they'll contribute to the discussion later. Uh, the first is that we're very clear that a responsible business should be defined as a company that pays its taxes, obeys the law, and makes a profit. We that asked, sounds like Milton Friedman. Well, we, we asked the British <laughs> public what they thought uh, in November of last year, and 82% actually agreed with that sentiment. Now, if 82% of the public is agreeing with that sentiment, I would suggest that the political class is living in a bubble that may be a little bit divorced from the reality of what everyday people think. Uh, the second is, I think the question is not what business can do to improve its reputation, but rather what the media and the political class can do to understand business better. Um, it's easy in the media uh, and in, in politics. You focus on the 6,000 large companies in this country because a lot of them are household names and they're people that you can talk about. What about the 28,000 medium-sized companies and the 1.1 million employers in total <coughs> who actually provide the bulk of employment and the bulk of economic activity? You don't have a great dialogue about those companies, so instead you only focus on the governance issues facing a very small percentage, dare say, FTSE 250, really. Um, the third point I'd want to make, which I think is, is truly fundamental here, is that a government that tries to regulate or legislate for greater responsibility, in inverted commas, in business, risks some very serious perverse consequences. I think James just touched on a few of the potential ones in his remarks there when, when thinking about uh, you know, knee-jerk reactions to what we've seen over the past few years. I think the promotion of responsible business is one thing, but actually using the tools of political power um, to enshrine a really subjective and fluid concept of responsibility into law will only result in compliance regimes, tick box stuff, burdens, red tape, regulation costs. I don't think it will actually result in a change in outcomes or a better situation. Um, so I guess to conclude, uh, finally, I think we need a different narrative about business in Britain. Um, you know, shameless self-promotion, that's why we run our own Business is Good for Britain campaign, and actually talk about case studies of real businesses in the real economy, whether they're big PLCs or small companies, acting responsibly on an everyday basis. The trouble is, you don't often hear about them. Uh, so I think we should hear about them a bit more in these discussions about responsibility, and perhaps the outliers and the scoff laws a bit less. Great. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, I'd like to talk about something slightly different, looking, looking at the question of uh, responsible capitalism uh, through the prism of corporate structures. Because I think we are in very exciting times at the moment with opportunities for significant changes to take place in the way our companies are formed and, and run. I mean, when I started as a corporate lawyer in the um, 1960s, 
the sole responsibility of company directors was to maximise the profits of the shareholders. That was enshrined in the company's legislation. We steadily have moved a little bit away from that in the directors now are required to take into account the interests of employees and other stakeholders and of course there's the corporate social responsibility agenda which is also coming enshrined in, in, in companies behaviour company law but we think in the Liberal Democrats that this is a big opportunity with the current recession to look again at the uh, structures um, we, we as a party over the years have always been uh, very much in the forefront of arguments for greater employee ownership. Indeed, one of, one of the only lasting effects of the Lib Lab Pact in the, in the, um, 19, the end of the 1970s was some changes to the tax law implemented on, on, under pressure from the Liberal Party in, in that pact for, for tax relief on employee ownership. And that was. Uh, that was, I think, probably the only lasting uh, result of the Lib Lab Pact. And we as a party have always flirted with the idea of two-tier boards very much on the German, on the, on the German system. Um, Nick Clegg, in a speech um, earlier in the year, referred to um, trying to create more John Lewis's, uh, more companies formed on the uh, John Lewis model. Um, and today, this, this meeting is rather opportune because this morning uh, we approved our policy on employer ownership and mutualization in the conference. And if I can just share with you um, some, some of those policies, um, I mean, the, the basic proposal is that legislation should be amended to allow the option of a two tier board structure where companies and, and employers wish to adopt it that where 5% or more of the shares are owned by employees, the employees have the right to elect a member to the board. There should be a minister in biz with responsibility for this, this whole area. And fundamentally, there should be a right to request in the following circumstances, uh, where employees of public listed firms with over 250 employees have the right to request 5% of the shares. Employees of all companies limited by shares with over 250 employees have the right to request an employee share scheme. And at the point of transfer of any business, employees have the right to put in a bid for the firm that employs them. Um, employee share ownership should be uh, encouraged in the same way as in the United States with a discount on capital gains tax. Um, and the, the new minister, in conjunction with the uh, Department of Community and Local Government uh, should have responsibility to build community-based initiatives for mutualisation. Now, this is all, all pretty radical stuff. What I do know, what, what I do know is that the uh, Liberal Democrat um, members of the coalition are very keen to progress, uh, su progress some of these ideas. And of course, we do have the um, Secretary of State for the biz who, who um, will we'll run with this. So, so I think this, 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 I believe, is part of the debate that we're having today. Great. Thank you. Ian? Um, Ian Smith, I'm a partner at Deloitte, so in the audience, uh, the purpose of the audience, I, I represent business and big business, as it were. So I deliberately didn't bring my red braces this morning, but for <laughs> every instinct in my body had to do so. Um, I think you're representing our readers, so... Uh, that's good. good. Thanks, John. Uh, I, my, our perspective on this, uh, and it, it somewhat comes from where Adam is talking about, business, I think we all accept, uh, has let itself down over the last four or five years with taxpayer bailouts, executive remuneration issues, um, but it is the, the masses being denigrated by the few. What we have to actually understand is that the majority of businesses in this country are well-meaning, well-run uh, and profitable, responsibly run organisations. Notwithstanding that, there is clearly a message that we need to get across in terms of why we're doing that, how it benefits society in the broadest sense. And what, the other thing we need to bear in mind is the context. So the context is business is taking a bit of a bashing over the last five years. But if you look at other big institutions in society, newspapers, parliament, you know, this is, this is not, we're not, we shouldn't disconnect the two. Society as a whole is looking at its big institutions and expecting more responsibility for them. So it is incumbent upon us to respond to that 
Um, it doesn't necessarily mean changing the fundamentals about how business operates because in, in its purest sense business is absolutely vital for a thriving society. It brings technology, it brings innovation, it brings challenge, it brings employment. So we have to recognise that that remains the case. The, my, my, my proposition is that business actually needs to get across in a more articulate, more articulate way what we are doing in terms of society. So it is business leaders sitting down saying, what's my business for? What's its purpose in this industry? How do I contribute to society? Making sure that pervades itself through an organisation so the key stakeholders, the shareholders, the employees, other directors understand and appreciate what that is. And one of the things I've seen, I mean, I've been in my business nearly 20 years now, but over time, you know, we recruit lots of people. Every single year we recruit uh, 3,700 people into Deloitte. There is definitely a shift about when, when you are in the war for talent, people want to know what you are going to do for them, not just in terms of remuneration, but in terms of what you will bring to them and the organisation they're in. They want to feel proud of a business that contributes to society. So our involvement with the 2012 Olympics and Paralympic Games, we did a lot of pro bono work. That was massively important in terms of attracting the best people and retaining the best people, because they felt proud to be part of what we were doing there. So I, I think it, in conclusion, comes back down to how we tell the story. Yes, the, 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 the few have distorted the view of the masses, and we do need to deal with that. But fundamentally, businesses just need to get that message across in a clearer way. Great. Well, look, thanks very much. That's an admirable panel, uh, short and, uh, and to the point. Thank you very much. I'll, um, we're obviously going to have a, a broad discussion with the audience, but I'm going to start off by asking one or two questions of that, uh, that those opening points raised. And one of them, I think, uh, uh, one of the things I was hearing between um, Tim and Adam uh, is a, what seemed to me a disagreement about what business is for. Uh, I mentioned in the middle of Adam's discussion Milton Friedman's statement on the purpose of business, famous shareholder statement that says a purpose, that the purpose of business is to make a profit for the shareholders, providing that the company is obeying the legal and moral norms of the society. It is not to go out and work for other stakeholders that the company may define, such as the unions, the greater good of society, responsible business. Now, I heard a disagreement here. I heard it, uh, that Adam essentially believes in the Milton Friedman view of business. Is that right? I think you can be a responsible business and adhere to those, and adhere to those principles. I don't think it's a black or white issue where you can actually take responsibility away from a business that adheres to the legal framework, pays its taxes, and is abiding by the spirit and the letter of the law. So as long as it's abiding by the spirit and the letter of the law, and it pays its taxes and it doesn't do anything shocking that it should be sent to jail for, or its director should be sent to jail for, mm. then it's contributing to society by its very nature. Those are its obligations. What the business then chooses to do, and I think that's what Ian just has come on to, what the business then chooses to do, whether it's to bring employees and talent into the business, whether it's to show its commitment to the communities and where it operates, is surplus. It is excess. It's over and above. But I think the message is that most of the businesses that we represent, most of the businesses I see out there, are doing both. Right. But, but Ian's definition was interesting to me because it, he, he suggested that it was good for the business in terms of recruitment or so forth to act responsibly. Absolutely. There was a sort of utilitarian benefit to being seen as a good member of society. But that, of course, doesn't contradict the idea that it's simply good for shareholders, that you're doing whatever is good for shareholders. And if it means sponsoring the Paralympics or behave or or behaving in what appears to people to be a good and attractive way. That's basically for the shareholders, is that right? It's, it's for the shareholders, but ultimately, well, ultimately it's for the shareholders. <coughs> but my premise is that the, the more progressive businesses are in accepting social responsibility as a key part of their strategy, they will differentiate themselves from their peers and therefore be more successful. Because they will get the best people and they will have better relationship with their customers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right, and I do disagree, and, and I, th I think that the proposition, the Milton Friedman proposition, uh, would have been true had we been having this meeting 120 years ago. But the world has actually moved on in terms of, you know, I mean, <coughs> without being technical about it, the law has moved on from that proposition. It, you know, the, the directors do have obligations that go wider under the current company law, that go wider than, than just the Milton Friedman, Friedman Proposition. So I, th I think you know we can't put the genie back back right. into back into the lamp. I mean, the, the, it, 
that argument is over. Uh, uh, the, the question is how much further should it go? Right. But it's rather a different point as to whether people should sponsor the Paralympics or what that. Because ultimately, as you rightly say, that could be justified as being the benefit of the shareholders because the, right. uh, yeah. the genes yeah. running rampant don't yeah. necessarily yeah. do good things. Yeah. I want to ask Tim a, a separate question, which is uh, you talked about, well, we could have been having this discussion 120 years ago. From what you're saying, two tier boards, employee ownership, that sounds awfully reminiscent of an entire decade of discussion that we had in the 1970s, and it frankly Which went on nowhere. Yes, well, the idea that yes. we should be, we should move from Anglo-Saxon capitalism to the German model has been talked about for a very long time and simply hasn't got very far. Yes, although of course that, that is right, uh, it's now back on the agenda, I think, and I think the whole structure of how companies are organised is back on the agenda primarily because of the perception that the existing structures rather fail. Uh, I, mean that, I mean, that which is really the underlying Has it purpose. Of, well, it's failed in the sense that, that, that um, it, it hasn't delivered what, over the last four years, what everybody assumed it would deliver. Now, you can say that's for the worldwide pressures, you can say all sorts, sorts of reasons, but the, the reason these issues are on the agenda are because it's quite clear. Let's take John Lewis as an example. John Lewis is clearly a hugely successful uh, company, um, and, and it is not organised in the traditional companies that way. It's organised as well. it's, it's owned by owned by the employees. Now, now, when the economy was booming, people didn't focus on that sort of thing because yeah, everybody was doing well. But but I think we, you know, this is an opportunity for, for, to look look again at whether that. Not, right. not replacing existing structures, but supplementing and complementing right. existing structures. Well, it's certainly true that there's been a move away from mutualisation in terms of building societies yeah. and so forth, right. and we could talk about whether right. or not we should move back in the right direction. Right. I want to ask uh, Adam one question. You, you talk about your members or mm -hmm. your people you represent, small businesses contributing to society, just really want the government off their backs and not to start interfering with them, but you guys support Vince Cable's idea of a business bank, don't you? Now, isn't that the government uh, stepping in to help the market? Um, there's a clear market failure in terms of business access to finance where we think they can play an important role. Um, I think the, business group, the businesses that we represent are very pragmatic. They will support government intervention where markets are perceived to be failing. But what they, what they don't want, what they don't want is actually intervention where there is no failure, and, and I, I disagree with Tim who said you know, the, there's a perception that the model of corporate governance has failed. That's exactly right, it's a perception. But if you've got 4.5 million businesses in the UK, uh, amongst which you have several dozen where there may have been governance problems, that is not that the model has failed, that means that there are some people who have done things wrong and probably need to, uh, to address that. Okay, um, it, but it sounds a little bit to me that you want the government to do things you want, but not the things that it should go away when you when it stopped doing the things that you have. I'm a lobbyist. Like. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, James, tell us what the business bank should be doing. Well, I mean, I, I'm supportive of the business bank from the perspective that um, uh, I, that I do think it addresses a, an area of market failure, but it arguably also addresses an area of, of government policy failure as well, because um, one of the things uh, that and it's a problem, and it's not just the UK government. This is this is around the world. Is that all governments? are asking banks to hold much more capital today. And yet, on the flip side of the coin, they all want the banks to lend more. The two are completely incoherent, and, and you know, they, they just don't stack up. You cannot ask a bank to lend more and ask it to build its capital at the same time. Um, so the business bank, by creating a, a bank with new capital, um, is definitely a step in, in the right direction. I would actually like to see the government go further and um, start to back off from the uh, drive to higher capital ratios. Um, it's something which uh, I think is, is incredibly damaging, um, and I think that um, if you really want the economy to succeed, you get the banks to lend now and you get them to build their capital ratios later. Arguably, it, this is a, a twist on the Ed Ball's argument of you, know, you do austerity later. I would rather do the capital building in the banks later because until you get money supply growing, you won't get the economy recovering. So, in principle, I support the business bank. I'm still waiting to see exactly how it's going to work, and uh, you know, they're talking about 18 months to get this up and running. That's a long time when you want the economy to be recovering now. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question before we uh, go to the audience with some questions, and that is, you talked a lot about financial incentives and longer-term bonus structures and so forth at the top level of business and in the cities, where you used to work. Um, 
I mean, what's wrong with these people that they won't get out of bed unless you pay them a bonus, that, that, they, that they act on the basis of short-term financial incentives, when people who aren't in that position may act on completely different... I, I think a lot of us around the table, a lot of people in the audience, work not on the basis of that they'll only work if they get a, a bonus or that their behaviour will change if the bonus structure is slightly changed. They work on the basis that they get a salary, they go to work, and they try to do good. So what's wrong with your people? Uh, I wouldn't ask that's with my people. Um, but yeah, um, for, for full disclosure, I did work both for an investment bank and a hedge fund. So um, and I have seen this at, at first hand. I think that the problem, I mean, yeah, some of these guys are definitely driven by money. There's no two ways about it. Some of them are very talented, can make lots of money. I actually felt that the real problem in both, you know, particularly in investment banks, banking more generally, was the nature of the, the structure of compensation because people who are driven by the money, when you say to them, if you go and maximise your profits this year, you get the maximum payout, that's what will happen. And I saw people walk away from the city um, who were career to date, profit and loss negative because they blew up right at the end and still walked away with a lot of their bonuses intact. And this is where I think the structure's wrong and that's why I talked about incentives because people were given the incentive to gamble. And Chuck Prince, the CEO of Citigroup, I think is the best example of that. You know, we're not, we aren't going to stop dancing till the music stops. Yeah, that's fine if you are motivated on this year's or this quarter's profits. But actually, you, yeah, you should have been thinking five to ten years ahead. So, yeah, Citigroup up, grew up for what, the third time, I think, since, since the Second World War? And largely because I think that the structures were, were incorrect. And I think for a lot of these guys, they were actually, look, you're, you're driven by the desire to make money, that's fine. What I want to do is I want to put some risk control in there and say, if you do make the wrong decision, if you sell, to paraphrase an American investment banker, crap to somebody, um, actually it's going to come back and bite you. And that's about getting the incentive structure right. Okay. Can I just come back to one point on the sure. business bank, just for people maybe interested? I suspect, and I completely agree with all the reasons that, 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 that were articulated then as to why we need it, and I, I do worry about 18 months, um, I suspect that this is a compromise. Because I know that, I know that, that uh, there were various people in government, particularly on our side, who were arguing that what we should do is take over the whole of RBS and use that as the, use that as the, as, as the business bank. Um, that clearly was rejected by the Treasury because of the, of the potential loss to the taxpayer, but, but that would have created a much quicker way of getting this up and running, getting more lending. And why, why, do you, why do you think you're better at running a bank than, uh, than LBS? I mean, LBS is clearly bad at running a bank, but uh, <laughs> why, why would you be better if you're, if you're going to say, okay, well, let's forget about the capital ratios, let's just go out and lend some money? Uh, it wasn't suggested that the, man the management should change, it was just the ownership would change, which would mean that the taxpayer was underwriting, underwriting the, um, the, the policy, so you would have actually had, were that proposal to have been adopted, you'd have had different capital control issues than, than you would... But, so are you saying, sorry, but to James's point, there is a contradiction between the bank saying, between an authority saying to the bank, you've got to go out and lend more, and, and on the other side, the supervisors and regulators saying you've got to build up your capital. Quite. So, Which is why, well, uh, so you would have said, said you can run on the lower capital? Yes. Okay. That, that's what that proposal would have done. Okay. Because, uh, and when it was laid the through other, its capital. The, other, the reason that, that he is correct is that the, the one way you can, the only way you could square that circle would be if people were prepared to put more equity capital into banks. But they're not at the moment, which is why you've got the problem of the regulation insisting on capital basis being improved, uh, and, and also the politicians saying you've got to lend more. The two are incompatible. As you, which was right to say. Yeah. Right yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I just pick up on this eighteen months point? I don't think eighteen months is a problem here. We are operating in this short-term, as Whitehall and Westminster political world, and thinking this business bank has got to be in place now, tomorrow, yesterday. No, it doesn't. It needs to be there for the next 50 years, in the same way the German, the South Korean, and the American banks have been, you know, business banks have been. They were put in place, they weren't fooled around with, it wasn't done as a rush job, it was done over time and deliberately to be a pillar of the economy. We need to do it that way here. So I, I don't see 18 months as a problem. I see implementation, however, as a challenge for Whitehall because Whitehall's never particularly good at it. Okay. 
Let's ask for some questions or indeed some points from the audience there, but preferably phrasing a question in sort of form. This lady here. I have a question of Mr. Barty, who started off by saying that the shareholders should hold uh, directors, etc., to account. It's incredibly difficult to do that since the Big Bang, but those <coughs> shareholders have to hold their shares in a nominee company, which means that you're going through, the, the information has to come to you from the nominee company, and that if you have a number of shares, can be very complicated, and it means you can't react in time. So I think that's a bit of a dead duck, unless you can change and make it easier, the shareholders get the information they need to hold their directors to Okay, let's have a quick response. Yeah, I, and I, I do agree with you. It's actually, this, this, um, uh, this breakdown, this agent principle breakdown which you've got is, is, is a very, very big issue. And I, I think it's very difficult for individual shareholders to do this, um, which is why I said you know, you've got to look towards the institutions. And there is some, there is some evidence now. I mean, I, I happen to know, you know a number of CIOs in, in the city, they are beginning to look at this. And if you look, for example, at what the uh, insurance organisation of done, if you look what NFF have done, uh, they're actually encouraging their members to, to act, take a more active role in this. And I think when people are now choosing their fund managers, arguably it's incumbent upon us to, to ask the question of you know, not just who's got the best performance, but actually who's doing, doing the right job. But I also think that's why you need to do other things <coughs> like strengthen non-executive directors who should be representing those shareholders on, on that board and actually aren't answer, asking the question of the executives. The problem with NEDs at the moment, as I said earlier, is this, they do far too many jobs and they have far too little experience of the companies where they're meant to be grilling the executives. That's why we've got a proposal to change it. But I, I do agree with you as well. Okay. There was somebody at the back of our conference seat. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Philip Pataka from the Chartered Management Institute. I want you to ask um, everyone on the board about diversity. Um, to my mind, part of being a responsible uh, business is having um, thoughts in your mind about diversity, um, whether that be gender diversity, <coughs> women on boards, quotas, you know, how, however you do that. Is that part of your thinking, or do you think that business just has an obligation to employ the best person with the best skills um, in a full-time position at all times? Well, I'll, I'll respond first in that one. I think it is... It's to your latter point, but there needs to be checks and balances within organisations to ensure that uh, appropriate diversity is being developed and built in. So as a, as a business, we monitor the number of female partners we have. We actively monitor the different um, uh, religious groups, etc. So it, it needs to be monitored, but it still needs to be the best person for that job because that's how businesses operate in the most efficient way. Now. If it needs business to react in a certain way to accommodate people's domestic situations, then that should be absolutely fundamental to what we do. And I think most businesses do respond in that way. But it can't get away from the best person for doing that. I think, irrespective of my view, I, I'll give you the Secretary of State's view on this, which he entirely agrees uh, that diversity is, a, is a, an issue which must be dealt with. And I suspect the Company, that companies are subject to warning as that the government will legislate on this issue if unless there's significant progress is made towards greater diversity. Now, that's not a threat. I, I think he's on record as, uh, as, as saying that. And I, I think big companies are responding to, to, to this issue, although the progress is slow. Well, I should say in passing that the uh, audience is considerably more diverse than the panel, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll bring the legislation quite, to change that. There's, um, there's, there's, a, there's a clear route, sort of a middle way between the two, which is the route that Gordon Davis has advocated fairly successfully, which is the nudge approach. Yeah. What you try to do is right. you try to get as many companies as possible yeah. to up their game right. whilst allowing them to continue to select the best person yeah. for the job. It's interesting in our membership that the, the people who are most outspoken <coughs> against quotas or legislation are actually businesses run either by women or minority entrepreneurs who feel it would be counterproductive to their work. Yeah. It's really, really interesting to see that. So helping Mervyn Davis get his message out, and if there are people who haven't signed up to some of those commitments, that's probably the best way forward. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go there first. <coughs> yeah, hello, Ian Anderson, Cicero. Um, I'm just interested in the panel's views on... Sorry, you're Cicero. Cicero. Yeah, well, I've <laughs> actually Cicero group. Come back. Um, what, is, so what is Cicero? We're, we're a public policy um, uh, consultant. That's great. Right. Yeah. Interest in the panel's views on uh, key and whether or not key is taking us in the right direction. I mean, I've had a lot of debate that actually 
um, every, every, everything from Kay's completely useless right the way through to what Kay said actually will um, lead towards greater buy-side uh, activism. So interesting panel views on Kay. Okay. Kay report. We mean the John Kay report the John on Kay equity ownership. Yeah. Can we go? Yeah. Um, I, I, it's interesting. I mean, I've kind of read the bulk of the Kay report and I probably agree with half of it and I hate the other half of it. Um, and uh, I find most people like that with a lot of stuff that John Kay has, has proposed. I mean, I think what I think is he goes in the right direction. There's lots of stuff in there which says, yeah, we need to be more active with our fund management, we need to choose our, you know, we need to move away from benchmarks, um, we need to be much, much more activists. And some of the best fund managers, uh, I think, are already doing that. Um, what I struggle with in some areas is to try and see how you legislate for a lot of what John Kay is actually proposing. Um, but to my mind, the, the positives out of his report, and uh, you know, we're holding, he's actually come to talk to us at Policy Exchange, and we've got a you know, group of investors that are going to talk to him afterwards, is to actually find out what's the best way of moving towards, you know, I think, some of the very good conclusions out of the Kay report. And I think you know, it's, it's another one of these areas where you've got a little bit of market failure, and, and part of it's policy generated. For example, um, most of your IFAs cannot recommend to you to invest in a name stock because it it's, it's literally breaks their, their fiduciary duty to you. Um, and that's a rule that was introduced by the FSA. So there's lots of things which you can look at in the care report and go, well, actually, how do we break that? And some of it's about reversing some of the legislation, some of it's about encouraging people to take risks, some of it's about encouraging financiers to do their jobs differently. Um, so I, I think more to come on that, but some good, some good, some bad as the report. Yeah, I mean, Prince Cable's view on this is that he was surprised. He thought that, that Kay would come up with much, much more uh, bombshell type recommendations, and he was surprised. I won't say whether it was pleasantly or not. But he was <laughs> surprised uh, that that he didn't. His view is actually that almost all of Kay can be implemented without primary legislation. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's, it's a myriad of relatively small things that can actually be implemented. The one area that can't, which is you, you touched on, is the recommendation that the fiduciary definition of the fiduciary obligation should be, should be widened or, or clarified. Now, he's recommending that that should initially go to the Law Commission to have a look at, which, of course, would be a recipe for it going to the long grass and to be legislated for in you know, 2030. But but the um, so that that would, would require a primary legislation. But the rest of it, I think, can can be more or less implemented as it is. And I think the government is more or less in favour of it. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously, the devil's in the detail because we're talking about myriads of relatively small recommendations. That, yeah. that but but I think by and large, the government intends to implement. It. But by the way, just before we move on, can I just ask a question of the panel? Do you, uh, touching what the lady said to, in the first question, do you think that sort of the power of individual share ownership is effectively dead, that we really are in a world of institutional shareholders, institutional shareholdings, institutional fund management, and we better just accept it. Uh, or is there still a is there still a voice for the individual shareholder? It's going back to James's point. I don't think it's dead, but I don't think it's properly enabled necessarily. There is there is there is an important you know bit of work to be done to enable individual shareholders to exercise their voice. And I think, again, going back to something James said before, stronger non-executive directors and boards that properly set the remuneration packages towards the longer term, that properly look at how the company is doing business, can help to enable that. And if those non-executive directors are there saying, we care about individual shareholders, and we want them to be able to express their voice, <coughs> then you create it without completely throwing the system up in the air and seeing where the pieces fall, is a report. Um, so there are two separate issues though, aren't there? There's the one, there's the model where you have institutional shareholders <coughs> who hold the bulk of the company's shares and, and individuals who hold a minority of them. That's, that's one issue as to whether that balance is, can be improved. But then there's the other issue, which the takeover the panel has been trying to tighten up on under pressure from, from the department, uh, which is where stock, in particular in companies that are potential targets, are being let, stock is lent, lent to people who often so often you've got you've got uh, nobody knows who is holding the stock and who is actually en ending up voting on a takeover. And hedge funds have been you borrowing stock in order to in order, right. order to make money on a, on a takeover. And that, I mean that 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 is also inimical to the interests of individual shareholders. Uh, to, to be fair, to, to, to vote on a takeover, you actually have to 
own the stock. You can't just borrow it. You have to actually own the stock. But the, the problem is that on, on that particular issue... So you can up on that, aren't you? Yeah. But the, there the issue is that, um, as law currently stands, once a takeover offer has actually um, uh, occurred, you can buy the stock afterwards and then vote that stock. Right. That's where the problem lies. Okay. Yeah. Before we get any more technical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that lady there. Hi, uh, Florence yeah. Richard from ActionAid, which is an international development agency. Um, I'm sorry I've missed several of your presentation. I arrived a bit late, but I've got a very simple question. What should we do about irresponsible businesses, since I understood that the majority of them in the Western... Okay, do you want to just define what you mean by an irresponsible business? Well, so, like Adam said, um, a responsible... I mean, business has to obey to its legal obligation. It yes. shouldn't be necessarily doing more. One example would be, for instance, tax avoidance. Some businesses right. go through you know, very aggressive tax avoidance schemes, um, which we define as something quite irresponsible. Um, and I was just wondering, okay, what, what should we be doing about let's that? Let's talk about corporate tax avoidance, since we've got a lawyer. And, and <laughs> uh, um, is that a bad thing, corporate tax avoidance? There's a big difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Um, I, I, can, I can leave it to my colleague at one of the big four firms probably to tell you a bit more about him. Um, but you, you, know, you, know, you know, I mean, we have to be very careful with the words that we use here. Florence mentioned just now the phrase legal obligation. You know, you're, it, it is your legal obligation not to evade tax. Well, insofar as HMRC, HMRC, HMRC Barclays has just it. shut down its tax avoidance, a large amount of it to do with mm -hmm. uh, uh, corporate tax avoidance and, in, and wealthy individual corporate tax avoidance. And it said, we don't think our unit was breaking the law, but it didn't smell right. That's, and that's a good decision on that part. I, you know, I, I, I don't see a problem with that, right? But, the, but the, it, was actually drawing, clear. it was drawing the line differently from saying there's tax avoidance, which is yeah. all fine, everybody does <coughs> it, and tax evasion. It yeah. was actually saying this was legal tax avoidance, mm -hmm. But it was wrong. But as a company, it made a judgment call and a decision, and it may capture clients for doing that, it may get good press for doing that, etc. I, I don't have a problem with companies making that decision. I do have a problem, however, when we have very fuzzy words used, and, 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 and the line seems to move between the two right. day after day. So you know, tax avoidance is quite a motive, a motive um, phrase. Uh, uh, as Adam says, it, it isn't in its purest sense illegal or, or irresponsible, but uh, I mean, again, caveat what I say, but I'm part of a firm that does tax planning for clients, etc. <laughs> tax evasion is clearly wrong. People should be punished for it. Tax avoidance is playing by the rules, but whether or not you're within the spirit of the rules is another matter. Mm -hmm. Businesses should, for their own account, consider whether reputationally that's the right thing they wish to do. Uh, and as you say, Barclays yeah. decided that is not the right thing to do, therefore we show it, and I applaud them for that. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes down to the ethics and the morals and the... And the the corporate governance of an institution. But sorry, this isn't quite. I mean, this isn't quite addressing the real point, is it? That over the years, there's been there's been a move from tax avoidance to aggressive structures, international structures, which are what the industry itself calls aggressive tax avoidance. Which is they anybody will say it's within the law. It's within the law of the Cayman Islands. It's within the law of the British Virgin Islands. It's within the law of the UK. And of course, George Osborne in his budget speech angered a lot of the right wing of his party by calling it morally repugnant. Right. Which that's the chance of checking. But I don't see, I don't hear from the panel, although everybody says it's a bad thing if it's a bad thing, if, it, if people are upset about it and it becomes morally repugnant and it's a bad thing, we'll stop doing it because of a reputational risk. But I don't hear people saying actually businesses and wealthy individuals should take a, diff, a broadly different attitude. I think, uh, 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 I think what is happening now is that the government believes that there is a huge amount of revenue to be obtained simply by clamping down on actual tax evasion rather than, rather than legitimate tax avoidance. And indeed, they're putting resources in, into um, uh, the, the government, um, into HMRC, to, to try and do this. I mean, I've heard the figure of seven billion a year being... Um, being right bandied about that would be recovered were, were that, but that's not from avoidance, that's actually from, from evasion. Uh, and HMRC are, are having a go at the <coughs> um, ornate film schemes, yeah. which they seem to be winning, um, which again, you know, Alex Ferguson invests £100,000 in 
a film and gets £500,000 of tax relief, which probably might be regarded as slightly morally repugnant. Yes. Like picked on him. It's also <laughs> that it's been around for more long than time, ten, long ten time, years. Long time, I remember yeah. a guy who's the chairman of a very large and very well-known company mm -hmm. saying to me that, that he, ten years ago, that he'd been involved in, he'd been offered mm -hmm. to invest corporately through, through a film uh, production mm -hmm. company under yeah. one of these schemes, and he right. said, I just cannot see how it's justified. No, quite. Right. They've been around for a long time. A long time. Yeah. Um, um, Ian had answered, um, I'm from the cooperative group, we're a member of a cooperative, about 7 million members of got the UK, and if you know us as a co-op, or the co-op bank, uh, on, on the ground. Uh, my question is about um, the, the role of mutuals in the corporate landscape. People talk about diversity, and, not, and we believe it's important for <coughs> corporate diversity. What would the panel do to, to support a more diverse corporate landscape for the rest of the um, lack, of lane, lack of a level playing field, in, right. in particular on financial services regulation, capital requirements. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting, very interesting question, and get the panel's view. And just to remind the audience, in financial services, there's been enormous demutualisation, and it's not just building societies mm -hmm. and insurance companies. It's investment banks. Goldman Sachs used to be a cooperative. Morgan Stanley was a cooperative. All the largest investment banks used to be partnerships. And there are issues to do with whether or not that's fundamental. When they demutualized, and played in the stock exchange, not only building societies, but it fundamentally changed incentives and made this, the systemically made, made financial services firms more fragile. So I think it's a very interesting question. And... What thoughts do we have? Well, I, I work for a mutual, so I'll pick that one up. Yes. <laughs> to start with, Chambers of Commerce are mutual, are mutual organisations. They're owned by businesses on the ground in localities who come together in a local chamber of commerce. The local chambers of commerce, they're known the British chambers of commerce. So we are by every definition mutual. Um, you know, mutuals are great. They're wonderful. They have a, a, you know, a very specific role to play. But I have a, a, a very strong alarm bell ringing in my head when politicians and the leader of this party in particular pick up one company, i.e. John Lewis, which is, in Malcolm Gladwell's definition, a very serious outlier in terms of the, the sort of ecosystem of types of corporate governance and, and ways that businesses are run in this country, and suddenly says, oh, we can have a lot more companies like this. I don't think that companies like John Lewis or, or the Cooperative Group or others are, are easy, nor, nor do they emerge overnight, nor do you see business models changing particularly easily. So whilst I think mutuals are fantastic, I think we need a note of caution here. We could get to a scenario where 0.5% or maybe even 1% of companies in this country are run on a mutual basis, right? This is not the game changer, just like certain other elements of corporate governance which have been floated in previous years were not the game changers. The question actually is probably more to Tim's points from before. At points of transition or business succession, how do you encourage you know, other things which are akin to mutualization, such as employee ownership mm -hmm. share schemes and other things. I mean, the, the, the practical answer to your question uh, uh, is that um, two, two things. First of all, we, we would uh, try and legislate to have a level playing field but on, on the issues you're talking about. But secondly, and most significantly, we would have a, a minister in De Beers with responsibility for this area and drive, driving this area through. I entirely agree with your point. I've never suggested, nor have we suggested, that every, we've got to turn everything into a John Lewis, what, what, or, or indeed a co-op, but, but you know, we think this is an opportunity to look at complementing existing corporate structures with more companies along the lines that you're talking about. And there have been quite a lot of other examples on the co-op. I mean, look at, I mean, look fine. Um, when, when the owner died, they, they turned that into an employee and, um, and um, organisation. So, I mean, there are plenty of examples around the country where this has worked. Can I just make two points on this? First of all, I mean, employee share ownership isn't, isn't a, a solution to everything, and Lehman's had an incredibly high level of employee share ownership, and you know, it's still probably horrible cost. Um, the second point I'd make, just to, on the point about demutualisations, and it comes back to the whole sort of agent principle thing I was talking about earlier, one of the biggest problems. Uh, in investment banks is that when all the partners could lose their houses and lose all their wealth if the if the organization went bust they were much more careful about taking risk you know in the situation where that got changed and all you could really lose was your job um, people became much more risk taking which is why I think you know going back to incentive structures and making sure that yeah you know, it's what's always called skin in the game in the hedge fund industry is that if you look at investors in hedge funds they always insist that the owners of those hedge funds have a significant stake in their own fund and that's about aligning shareholders 
um, incentives with executives' incentives, and, and it's got to be done properly. And you've got to have executives having downside if they fail. Of course, hedge funds are mutual organisations. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Barnes from Cleveland Executive Square of Government Affairs Consultancy. Um, it's been put to me that um, a number of the worst, um, the, the, the causes of a number of the worst bits of advice and action since the financial crisis originated in London. So that, uh, for example, the um, advice to Lehman on some of its repo transactions was approved by London lawyers that had been vetoed by ones in New York. And since then, a number of the big trading scandals from the uh, J.P. Morgan Whale to the UBS uh, <coughs> also been London centred. Does the panel think it's fair to say that London is worse than New York from a moral, ethical point of view on financial services, and if so, what, what can be done about it? Actually, on, just to supplement that point, I think there was evidence in the trial of Quaker Adeboli, the EBS Road yeah. Trader, on Friday, where the American risk manager who had come from New York said there were transactions here and a style of uh, risk management that would not be acceptable in New York, was happening in London. At least that was the evidence. So, uh, any thoughts? Well, I'd like to comment on that because I work with companies on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, the, the US approach to risk management is, is very rigorous. The SEC are a fearsome watchdog. Um, but on the, on the flip side, it's very much a tick box approach to life. Uh, I'm actually quite proud of the UK approach to risk management. It's common sense, it's pragmatic. A lot of this comes down to the attitudes of individuals and, and individuals within teams. And I don't have an answer as to why that perpetuated within London as opposed to New York, but uh, I, I would hate to see our corporate culture evolve into what is more of a, a tick box approach as in the US because it, it, it detracts from value in what we're trying to achieve here. But actually, there's a, there's a general question about the tick box approach and, and more bureaucratic approach of US regulation. But there's also a cultural question here, isn't there, about the attitudes of professionals and whether or not they're prepared to approve more sh more on the line transactions or not. I mean, a fair Is there something a bit in the water in London that just makes people the, I mean, this is this is very generalist. I would say there's an utter fear in the US environment of making a mistake. Complete paranoia, well, this will not happen. Uh, in the UK there's much more acceptance of risk because risk is part of value creation. So there's greater tolerance. That, I don't think that means there's a systemic failure in our risk management process that will perpetuate these sorts of thoughts. I think there is a definite cultural difference, and as is more positive, I feel really strongly about that, because people are not thinking through the issue, they're thinking about the, the next step in front of them to managing a particular point of hand. Mm -hmm. I, I can't go on this one, but I mean, all I'd point out is Citigroup, Bear Stearns, Lehman's, you know, it's not like the US didn't make mistakes in their risk management. Enron. Um, and yeah, even the JP Morgan, although the, the trader was in London, you know, it's part of the CEO's uh, office. Um, uh, what I would argue is that, uh, John and I talked about this at the beginning, is that if you look at pretty much all the financial institutions that failed, whether they were mutuals or whether they were, um, uh, uh, whether they were traditional PLCs, they were just all bad examples of bad risk management. Risks that were taken incorrectly, risks that were taken without a you know, due care to the long term horizon. It was bad risk management regardless of where you were, whether you were in London or New York and, uh, or anywhere else in the world, frankly. Uh, you know, it went wrong in Holland, uh, it went wrong in Germany, um, you, know, you, you had some of the Landis banks making terrible mistakes in Germany. Um, so it's, it's, I don't think it's specific that's, sorry, to London. Isn't that the traditional role of Landis banks? It's yeah. terrible yeah. mistakes. <laughs> you can be the most gullible person. <laughs> but not, not making an automated transfer to Lehman, it's just before it went bust. But, you know, Which they did. We, we can carry on going. You, you've, got, you've got the Catalans in Spain, you've got some of the, some of the right, French banks. You know, the mistakes were made right away across, across the world in, in the financial area. The only common linkage was bad risk management and, and well, bad decision making by, by the management. I agree with that. Yeah, I just had a question. My name is Karen Potter. I'm with the Sustainability Hub. Uh, we started off the conversation in terms of defining what makes a good business. A lot of it was talking about uh, following the letter of the law. And businesses are very, very involved with affecting that letter of the law and influencing what that law is. And I just wondered from the panel's perspective, we talked about making things more updated to reflect where we are in the relationship between business and politics. And I just wanted to know if there was anybody want to comment on 
and where the businesses actually affect that law. And there yeah. I work in environment, it's a big, it's a big issue. What can the company do to um, how they manage their actual physical presence and what their uh, effect is on the landscape and the communities around them? Right, the, and I'd be interested actually just as a matter of my own personal interest. Having just come from New York, Washington is clearly a lobby-based uh, approach to legislation. There's a lot of money poured into people's re-elections. There's a lot of factors and forwards lobbying on the details of laws like Dodd-Frank. Is it different here? Is it more behind the scenes, or is it simply that politicians decide and businesses get shut out? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I mean ha having done 15 years as um, a spokesman in this, in this area, whenever there is legislation, you are inundated with, with people. Um, yeah, inundated with, with lobbying. I don't, not, not, it's not lobbying people taking you out for lunch or dinner. I mean, it, it's, it usually takes the form of an email, and, and very often the email will set out the, the drafting of the amendments that right. the, the, that, that particular organisation You're receiving a lot of email. Do you feel that you have to take any notice? Oh, absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Why? Because, you know, actually the lobbying organisations do your, a lot of your work for you. Ah. Because you know, because you know, the 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 um, and, and and the government takes notice too. I mean, I mean, the the um, huge amount. I mean, it's it's clearly not lobbying in in the way that traditionally Washington has has done so. In, in the sense that organisations here don't, I mean, with I think, uniformly do not campaign for or against individual candidates in constituencies in the way in the way that happens in the United States. But but but. Um, it, in terms of the, the actual day-to-day -day detailed lobbying in relation to legislation, that is absolutely fundamental to the way we legislate in the United States. And that's right across the board, it's not just... Uh, absolutely. But no. Because the traditional constitutional model of the UK would say, well, there you are, a politician, and you get your, you get your civil servants to sort out the details of this stuff. You, you, usually, with, usually, with le usually with legislation, getting it amended is is having to deal with the civil servants who normally think that they are right on every topic and they have to be, they have, you have to try and okay. get the minister well, that's, to, that's to dissuade them. To go. <laughs> We're going to have one more question before we go. Um, how much is this agenda, this responsibility agenda, um, sorry, my name is Tamsin, I come from a group called the Alliance for Lobbying and Transparency. Which we don't have here, which you do have in the States, so we don't know who's lobbying here. Uh, anyway, that's not my question. How much is this, of this responsibility uh, agenda is being driven by the very public crises that we've been having? So whether it's Barclays, BP, Blackberry, Toyota. And then to what extent um, is the response going to be a communications one as opposed to a structural one? So, I mean, you look at Tim Burt's book, uh, the former FT journalist, on, called The Dark Arts, but he said that CEOs over the last five years have been getting incredibly nervous and so have been investing much more in crisis planning. Um, and so it, that so it suggests a communications response rather than a structural response to uh, I think the answer is it's both. Um, I, I think you, clearly companies are aware they've got to get their communications better, but I also think there, there are a lot of people and a lot of boards now asking you know, questions. And the Barclays example of shutting down a tax planning unit is a, is a good example of a company going, actually, should we be doing that? Maybe not. Uh, and I think um, it's not just you know, public and media and government, <coughs> actually, there's pressure coming from shareholders now because you know, one of the things that can damage a brand of a company more quickly than anything else is for them to be seen to be doing something which is you know, pushing the limits. There is sometimes an assumption made that a structural response is right and a comms response is wrong. And I think a comms response can happen, if the comms response can deliver the change without the perverse consequences associated with legislation and additional regulation, in many cases it can, it, just like the example that James has just mentioned, then it can be extraordinarily valuable. Okay, well look, thank you very much members of the panel and the audience, uh, that was a great discussion, thank you. Thank you.